Let's cross over to Ramallah, where Human Rights Watch Israel-Palestine director Omar Shakir is set to be deported from Israel within the next few hours. Now, earlier this month, the High Court of Justice upheld a deportation order by the Israeli government. Shakir's visa was revoked because of his support for boycotting Israel. Let's listen in to uh, Kenneth Roth. He's the executive director of Human Rights Watch. Should be exempt from the global rules that apply to companies everywhere. It is promoting Israel exceptionalism. Now, Israel claims deportation is not about Human Rights Watch. It's only about Omar. We can replace him, it says. But during the whole time at Human Rights Watch, Omar simply promoted Human Rights Watch policy. Human Rights Watch does not endorse BDS, nor did Omar during the entire period of his tenure with the organization. So it's not about Omar, it's about Human Rights Watch. There's no point replacing Omar because our next researcher would have the exact same problem that Omar did. They would, just like Omar, be promoting our view, our policy, that businesses should avoid complicity with Israel's illegal settlements. So as a result, we're not gonna replace Omar. Omar is going to continue as Human Rights Watch's Israel-Palestine director. We wish that he could continue to work from Israel, but instead he will have to work from a neighboring country that doesn't censor us. I'm probably beginning in Oman, but possibly in some of our other offices in the region. There will be a cost to that. It will be harder for us to engage, not only with Israeli authorities, but perhaps most important, with Palestinian authorities and even with Hamas. Physical presence does matter. But we're used to operating in countries that bar our researchers. We learned the necessity of monitoring human rights abuses from afar in countries like Iran and Egypt and Venezuela, all of which have barred our researchers. Israel today is joining that ugly club of governments. I should note that we also can supplement Omar's work with our local staff. You, you just heard from Khalud. And we will at times be sending in um, other of our crisis researchers, our researchers without portfolio, who for short periods can work in this country under Omar's direction. So the work is absolutely going to continue. It's also a matter of principle, because if Israel can pick our researcher, if Israel can preclude certain topics, imagine what other governments will do. China will say you cannot monitor Xinjiang. Saudi Arabia will say you've got to leave Yemen alone. Myanmar will say you can't touch the Rohingya. So as a matter of principle, we will redouble our work on Israel and Palestine. We will use the same researcher, the same principles, the same scrupulous objectivity, the same reporting on all sides to the conflict, and the same determination not to submit to Israeli censors. A final note. It is not coincidental that Israeli censors have focused on the illegal settlements, or the legal ones, if you want to believe the fantasy world in which Trump and Pompeo operate. The Israeli government clearly doesn't want the world focusing on the systematic discrimination and oppression represented by the settlement regime. But as so often happens, the censorship effort has only heightened global interest in what's being censored. It has only intensified the spotlight on Israeli misconduct. As a move to silence the messenger, the deportation of Omar Shakir has utterly backfired. Human Rights Watch will not submit to the blackmail of the abuser. Whether Omar is inside or outside Israel, as he directs this work, Human Rights Watch is here to stay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Um, so this is a very difficult day for me um, as Omar's uh, attorney, um, as Omar's friend, but also as an Israeli human rights legal activist. 
Uh, what we're witnessing today is a milestone in uh, the Israeli government's ongoing effort to suffocate human rights advocacy work in Israel and Palestine, to silence its critics, and to stop human rights activism in this region. For the Israeli human rights community, and I'm sure also for the Palestinian human rights community, this is an alarming day, a day that signifies the attempt not only to incite against us, not only to engage in, um, in attacks against us, not to have any discussion with us on ideas, on facts, but also to isolate us here and to detach us from our partners, our colleagues, our friends, and our network of support in the international human rights community. I want to say uh, on a personal note, uh, my parents immigrated to Israel in the, 60, in the 60s from Poland. They left the country where they were engaged in struggles for democratization, a country that was increasingly um, driving them out of the country not tolerating any criticism, not from inside and definitely not from the outside. They came here wanting to raise their children. Michael Strad there, the uh, lawyer for uh, Omar Shakir, just speaking there. We will continue to monitor, obviously, uh, this press conference. Let's bring in our correspondent uh, in Ramallah, uh, Nida Ibrahim. Of course, you've been there listening to uh, what's been said, certainly by Kenneth Ross, the executive director of Human Rights Watch. And, and, and really, uh, there is huge impact and significance of this deportation because it's sending out warning signals to anybody that is a human rights uh, observer or uh, uh, anybody who supports civil liberties within Israel and the occupied territories. It's sending a very clear message, certainly from the Israeli government and the Israeli courts. This is the first time for a human rights defender to be deported. Of course, this is based on a law that was passed in the Israeli Knesset in 2017 uh, that uh, says that anyone who uh, supports the BDS movement, which is the boycott, divest and sanctions against Israel, should be barred entry. Now, he wasn't just barred entry, he was asked to leave uh, a year and a half ago. This is a battle that uh, Omar Shakir and Human Rights Watch has started uh, uh, fighting since the decision of the Israeli government was made in May 2018 to bar him, uh, to deport him and revoke his work uh, residency. At first, the Israeli government has said that the reason for that is uh, Omar Shaker's involvement in BDS actions in the past. However, in the courts, uh, the Supreme Court's decision that was issued in November 5th, they said that the main uh, uh, that the Human Rights Watch, uh, Human Rights Watch's report uh, that called upon businesses to stop working in the illegal Israeli settlements is the main issue here, and it, it accounts to BDS. Of course, this is what Human Rights Watch uh, officials have been saying this morning, that this is not an attack against Omar Shaker himself. This is an issue that deals with the Human Rights Watch, with the work of human rights defenders. We've heard uh, them say that this is an alarming thing, that this aims to silence all critics of Israel. Of course, in the press conference, we, we uh, heard that uh, Nita, we're they're just saying going to is... stop you there uh, for a moment because uh, we can go back to that press conference because uh, Omar Shakir is going to speak. Uh, let's listen to what he has to say. Despite my deportation today, the Israeli government has failed to muzzle Human Rights Watch or the human rights movement. The world sees through the various labels that the Israeli government has attached to this case. The statement and outpouring of support that has come from the European Union, from the UN Secretary General, from civil society internationally, Israeli and Palestinian, speaks to what we all know this has always been about. It's been about an escalating assault on the human rights movement. But more importantly, this has shone a, li shone a light on the attacks that human rights defenders face. What I face is small in comparison to what so many others have gone through.
I've had the privilege and honor of being here for two and a half years. A privilege denied every single day at Israel's airport and borders to countless other rights advocates and others because of their background, because of their political views. That is a privilege I will cherish the rest of my life and that many others have not had to experience. Every single day, virtually, Israeli and Palestinian human rights defenders are maligned. Israeli advocates accused of uh, disloyalty, of being traitors, laws being put in place to restrict their access to foreign funding. And those that get it the worst are Palestinian advocates who face criminal charges, travel bans, and regular harassment from multiple authorities. I only wish the same number of cameras would focus on Palestinian rights defenders who have their offices raided by the Israeli army, those who receive bans from leaving the occupied West Bank, and those who have been put in administrative detention without trial or charge. But more importantly than even that, this case shines a light on the reality we face today. As we stand in this room, we're in year 53 of an ugly occupation with no end in sight, characterized by institutional discrimination, by systematic repression and rights abuses, in particular of the Palestinian people. If the Israeli government can deport somebody documenting rights abuse, without facing consequence, how can we ever stop rights abuse? The message that needs to be taken away from this room is there must be a reboot in the way the international community engages around this issue. So long as there is no consequence for the regular human rights abuse, so long as impunity reigns, you will only see more and more rights defenders coming under pressure, and rights abuse under the ground increasing. Today, it's Human Rights Watch. Tomorrow, it'll be Israeli and Palestinian rights defenders. The next day, it'll be the spouse of an Israeli citizen or a student studying at an Israeli university. Today, it's denial of entry and deportation. Tomorrow, it'll be criminal charges. Today, it is support for boycotts. Tomorrow, it'll, it will be calling for the International Criminal Court to open a formal investigation, or God forbid, calling the West Bank occupied or settlements illegal, which they are. There is a need for a new approach from the international community. But I want to end on a personal note. Looking around this room, I see many friends, civil society partners, and many others. <clears throat> what I want to say is it's been an honor of a lifetime to have worked with you for these two and a half years. This, in many ways, is my dream job. And I will be honored to continue to do this job from the outside. I've learned so much from each of you. And although I will miss working together on the ground every single day, please know that our resolve our determination will not wane one iota. We will cover the same issues, as Ken said, with the same intensity, with the same methodology, as we do everywhere else in the world. What makes this particularly hard for me on a personal level is I've gone through this before. I was forced to leave Egypt, a country that I'd spent much time in, after we documented a report on the mass killings of protesters. And I can tell you that what happened in the weeks and months after I left is people like the ones I see in this room left in exile, were detained, were under more and more pressure. Just last week, the, one of the last independent outlets of Egyptian media, Madame Musser, was arrested. I bring that up here because I tell you, I worry about where things will go. And this needs to ring alarm bells around the world, not because what I'm going through is worse, but it's because if the Israeli government tosses out Human Rights Watch without consequence, who is next? But I will end by saying I will not stop doing this work. We will not stop documenting. And to our Israeli and Palestinian partners, 
I end by saying we are on the right side of history. History will not look fondly at those that do not speak out in moments like this. And I will be back. I will be back the day when the day comes that we have succeeded in dismantling the systematic human rights abuse that affect Israelis and Palestinian in the system of discrimination. We won't stop. And I thank you so much for being here and for your solidarity. It means the world to me. Thank you. For those of you joining us here on Al Jazeera English, that was Omar uh, Shakir, who's from Human Rights Watch and having been deported or will be deported shortly uh, from Israel uh, for his uh, research work uh, on the abuses uh, in the occupied territories uh, and in, within the region. Let's bring in Nida Ibrahim, our correspondent, who was uh, following uh, that press conference uh, from Ramallah. And I think that he spoke very eloquently and really summed it up. The international community has to take note of what's happened today because if it's not Human Rights Watch today, it'll be another group tomorrow. As he said, uh, Sohail, who's next? If a human rights defender working with a high-profile organization such as Human Rights Watch is being deported, he's, he was asking in the press conference who, what's going to happen to Palestinian and Israeli human rights defenders. Are they going to be criminally charged as, as people who live in uh, this place? We've also met other people, for example, uh, Laith Abu Zaid, who works for Amnesty, and he has been banned. He's a Palestinian uh, worker there. And He's been banned travel uh, from uh, the Palestinian territory abroad. So this really poses a big question on what's going to happen to other human rights defenders. Are, gonna be, are, are they going to be silenced or not? For the moment, we will leave it there. Of course, monitor the fallout of that press conference in the coming hours. Uh, Nida Ibrahim, thank you.